Welcome to our Compose Cast, where we discuss productivity, self hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co host, Jack Moore. How are you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well over here. I'm doing pretty good. I am excited for the show today, actually. It's been, uh, I know we skipped a week here on our uh, regular schedule, so I'm excited to get back to it. Yeah, so some of this may be a little stale, but that means that we're just going to have double up the stuff for next episode, right? We get exactly. To, we get to pull everything else in, so uh, that'll be fun, um, but but let's dive into to what we have today. When I was setting up these show notes, I, I kept playing something through my head, and, and that was just how I how I navigate between stuff on, on my desktop. So one of the things that I've been trying to do is is to be able to find files in a more simple way and i'm doing that by sorting by the date modified field so almost any kind of file browser whether it be finder and mac os or windows default file browser or anything really in the linux ecosystem uh, is going to have the ability to sort by various things i think the default is usually going to be name now that becomes a little bit more difficult when you're uploading, say, a whole bunch of files that are, are like uh, camera images or or uh, video downloads, and those can get lost easily uh, if you don't sort them in an intelligent type of way. In in the first link I put in here, because I, I was doing some deep diving into like why is this even productive? Like like what what is the yeah. impetus behind this yeah. that that makes it so beneficial? And the, the first article is from lifehat.org uh, talking about Dropbox, right? And, and Dropbox obviously is the, uh, the next cloud closed source alternative and how to, how to work with that. Um, and, and they go through and, and talk about uh, different ways to organize files and, and folders. And I agree with some of them having, having a default set of folders, um, especially working within the, the team, you know, kind of level setting that. Uh, but their last one here, it says, add your initials and date to each file each time you update it so that everyone can easily say, <laughs> see who made the last update and when. <laughs> and that is such a 1999 life hack. I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. That that brought to light. Okay, so there, there absolutely is a problem here, right? As in, you know, if I start labeling stuff, if I have to save a copy, right, how do I know which is the most recent one, right? Do I have to final, start labeling it? Dot, V2 yeah. final final dot exactly. <laughs> you know, file extensions weren't made to do that. So, like, what, what do we use in order to, to indicate that? The next article in here from PC World back in 2009 – uh, so uh, over 10 years ago now, which is weird to say. Yeah, I was uh, looking at this one. I think it was for Windows Vista. Yeah, he was talking about Windows Vista. I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> it's like the, up- the upgrade to it, the upgrade to Windows Vista. But nonetheless, the content in it is still relevant. He he outlines a problem here that I saw, which is the, the need to pull a newly created screenshot or photo from the folder where I save images, right? When I save screenshots... Uh, they get saved to the same location as all of my uh, my my snippets, uh, my my downloads, everything. Right, everything kind of gets saved to my my bulk folder. And typically, what I've been finding is that every time I create a screenshot, right, it's because I want to act on that right away. It's because I either want to upload it so someone can see it, or I want to crop and edit it for future use. It's it's something that's directly actionable, right? So. It doesn't make sense for me to have to find that file the minute I save it because the minute I right. save it, that should be immediately available to me. What I've taken to do is to sort those folders by most recently – sorting them by most recently modified uh, gets me that I just saved this snapshot. It is at the very top and it is ready for me to go. And this is great uh, when I'm when I'm taking screenshots to upload files into Canboard, uh, when I am uh, downloading PDFs from my insurance company to deal with the car that got totaled. Yeah, yeah. I don't have to look around. I'm able to pull up my my folder and it's right at the top there. So that makes everything there easier. Uh, and then there's also in the second article he. 
he details out something that I had stumbled across uh, just by function of, of doing this, by, by experimenting with this, in that Vista, in his article, and actually almost all, all operating systems going forward from there, uh, or, or at least folder management utilities, will actually remember that setting next time you open that particular folder. So the, the views on there are saved in reference to that particular folder. Now, you could make global defaults and stuff, and, and that'll vary depending. There can exist directories where I don't necessarily need that, where I would rather stuff right. be alphabetical, just because that is the de facto. That's kind of the way my mind is trained in. But anything where I'm constantly adding and removing files or using as a temporary directory space, I would absolutely want that to always be the de default view when I go in to take a look at it. By date, of course. Downloads is the go-to, at least what I think of. Um, also, my Vivaldi browser has a built-in uh, capture utility that saves to its own other specific directory. Oh, yeah. So in addition awesome. to screenshots, I can also just select within my browser uh, what I would like. And it'll screenshot for you. Exactly, Pretty and sweet. save it yeah. in its its other one. Uh, that's that's been a super handy tool uh, in Vivaldi for me, uh, and and that, like I said, that folder as well is going to be sorted in in most recently modified. Uh, and then for all of the Linux junkies, um, I also included uh, a a really good cheat sheet type blog post in in TechMint about how to do this for in the in the command line. There's at least definitely a way to do it on the command line. And I wouldn't be surprised if I start playing around with aliasing some of these and seeing if I can get it to work on a per directory structure. But for the time being, um, I am, I'm really happy with that workflow. And it's really just, it, it's, it's gotten me a much smoother transition in my workflow between saving uh, media and then, then sending it off or using it. Or the one thing I had for you on the uh, first, uh, lifehack.org article did you see that they have where they say number your folders i'll just read it off for everyone who doesn't check it out so the first one is uh, have seven folders in your front line of folders uh, to make it easy for everyone to make the first decision as to where the file should be located which is fine i agree with that one the number two one they have is number your folders uh, so that everyone can communicate with a common language of where folders are i have an opinion on that I don't know what you think of it. I definitely wanted to hear if you had one on it. Well, I guess I guess my hot take would be why are you using numbers when words work perfectly fine? That's exactly what I'm thinking. Do you know how annoying that's going to be if you name it, you know, 1 through 40 or whatever, 1 through 200? I, I think it's kind of a dumb life hack, but a, a life hack nonetheless. I mean, it's it's hacking your productivity down if it's like hacking away at a productivity tree but <laughs> it's a life hack yeah hacking it down <laughs> yeah i looked at number one's pretty good you know seven categories or whatever that are right there that one that one is interesting in that obviously most most operating systems will come with a default set of folders my home directory came with documents downloads music pictures public templates and videos and the two that i've really benefited from is media well that's actually a share so that's that's mounted on the network sure yeah um, so I, I use that to differentiate from music and, and pictures i actually don't store anything in and then projects is where i keep everything that's under version control okay that yeah if necessary i can just wipe away and, and it's not something i have to back up because everything's pushed up to it's uh, get lab at this point. Or, yeah. yeah wherever yeah. yeah public's interesting i was actually reading up on public when i was trying to figure out what i should call this this folder that i throw all of my version control stuff in and public's actually a holdover from bygone era where public would be where you put stuff that you share um and on older operating yeah. systems, it would be like HTML public or something of the, the 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 sort where you would go to someone's home directory on a server like on OSU's campus. Like that's where they would keep the files that they wanted to display their web page. Uh, so that was that was in essence their web page where you would put stuff in there. But I, I have seen projects that use that public directory st still. Usually it's going to be peer-to-peer -peer protocols or something. So stuff of that nature you know home slash jack slash public 
Yeah. That's stored in there. Oh, yeah. how about that? Uh, and then usually I, I was I was playing around with Manjaro, and there is actually a program that you can just start running as a demon, as a user, and you can say, hey, share my directory at this IP address. You know, share my public. And the public directory is the default one that gets shared at that time. It's like that, you know, the, the, the thought process is still there, that that's where you would put stuff that you would want to share. How about that? That's kind but of there's interesting. Just, there's just so many other different protocols to use nowadays that that, it, that doesn't yeah. even make sense. Anymore. Why would you expose your laptop, workstation? I think what I would be most concerned about is that it's not shared by default, which is good. You're right. That's a spooky thought. All right, news then? Yeah, let's do news. So the first news item here is that uh, Python overtakes Java to become the second most popular programming language. And I am just about ready to have a party about that. Where are these lists coming from? Because you know what's number one on that list? C. And I'm thinking, who is still writing C at this point? Like, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of legacy stuff running C. Everything embedded is probably C or C++. But I'm thinking to myself, who sits down and writes? Like, a, when's the last time you wrote a C program? That's not my forte, right? But, okay. but there's a lot of Fair places enough. where that is legacy code. I don't know. I think I, I would be surprised if we see Python jump even over C here shortly. I think we're going to see a lot of that legacy code get refactored. Mainstream is definitely, I, I think Python's a way to go. It's it's almost, uh, what is it, pseudocode? Oh, shut up. It is, I'm telling you. Calling it pseudocode is a little bit of a jab. You think? No well, way. I, I, I do. I, I, I think it's because anyone can pick it up. Yes. Which is yes. nice. Absolutely. However... I think there's a whole nother side of Python that a lot of people would just really never get to. Um, right, there's right. been a whole lot of updates in, in Python 3 recently uh, that have really been blowing things out of the water, yeah. like the walrus operator. Uh, if you've looked into that, that is no. completely new. Uh, <laughs> you know, they, they did a whole lot of revamping of uh, functions. You can actually do strongly typed functions now. Like you can declare that a variable is a list. So they're, they're putting more of these, these lower level language features into this, this higher, more abstracted language if necessary. But they're not requiring it like the low level languages do. Right. Which is the main benefit of it? Anyone can pick it up. You can you can write really cool things, you know, in, in, in Python. You can use very advanced syntax, right? It it excels at that. Not only that, but it also has, besides JavaScript, maybe it has the largest library. Uh, oh yeah, out there absolutely. And and it was interesting that you brought up by you know whose standards uh, it was. Yeah, that's what I always have to ask. Usually Stack Over Overflow does a pretty good uh, survey. And that's exactly what I what I pulled up here. And I like oh, what they okay, do here. Okay, okay. Uh, it's, it, dude, mind meld right here, right here, you and I. Yeah, I know Stack Overflow does one every year. And I'm always thinking, who, you know, what's number one, what's number two? What's, what's their list usually say? And they released their 2020 results in May. So this is from, from back then. They have a uh, breakdown into three categories. The first one is the most loved programming language in 2020 okay. yeah yeah and that is the number one there is rust believe it ah, or not. okay okay fair enough i mean All right. i like like i said that would be that would be my next foray if i wanted to learn a completely new language yeah. talk about talk about low level that thing is ridiculous. seriously yeah. yeah they also have a most dreaded programming language Whoa, what is at the top of that one visual basic <laughs> uh, followed by Objective C and Perl. Ah, oh, how about that? Okay, so that's that's Stack Overflow's uh, report. Next is that Google Photos uh, is planning on ending its free unlimited storage yeah. on June first, twenty twenty one. They point out that, and, and this is full of caveats. So I'm I'm not going to try to go over the entire situation here yeah i was gonna say there are a bunch of gotchas in that article you know with this entire thing going on um yeah like like one of the things here is uh google already counts original quality quote unquote photo uploads against the storage cap in google photos so it's like right. it's already in place um but then it's it's not uh and then pixel owners are are not going to be put in that limit um and then everything that's uploaded before 
June 1st, 2021 will not count against that 15 gigabyte cap. I'll tell you what. So my dad does it. He uploads, he uploaded all the photos, I guess, to there. He has terabytes upon ta- I, I I was like trying to get a, a read on how many, he, how much data he has up there. Cause I'm like, how would it like, what, what, how much do, data and stuff do you have up on the cloud? And he said, uh, oh, about a terabyte. And I'm like, of what? And he's like, oh, just videos and photos. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what? You know, I asked him, what are you going to do? He's like, well, I guess I got to find a new provider. I was like, let me know how it goes. He's, he's looking for something free. And I don't know who's going to hold a terabyte of data for nothing for you. But yeah, I mean, I, I have a problem with free, obviously. Um, yeah. And I, I think I think we've gotten into this frame of mind where the Internet is just this place of free stuff that people do for us. Yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely not. You're the product if it's free, right? <laughs> and even if you're the product, the company that coined that slogan is now charging you. <laughs> it's a, I think it's hilarious that they're starting to charge for this, honestly. It, it really is. I think they even quoted in the article, they said... Uh, we needed to start making money or something along those lines. I'm just thinking, oh my gosh, are you like you? How are you going to bait and switch people like this? And they keep doing it for everything. That I, I feel like every product they offer now, in, in some way, shape, or form, is a bait and switch. It's like sign up for this; it's free. And then two two years down the road, they get you with the, oh hey, by the way, we're updating our terms or whatever, and you got to start paying for the service. Well, and there's two important gotchas that I wanted to point out as as well for this, right? That that are even a little bit more insidious and a little bit more hit hit closer to home for people who who would be, otherwise be com- completely blindsided by this. The first one is that uh, Google Docs, Sheets, Slides, Drawing, Forms, and whatever Jamboard is, right? These all these other Google Media producing, storage consuming services will also start to count against those storage caps. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. So photos, yes, but this is integrated into a much broader storage camp discussion with Google and, and they're going to start implementing this, right? And, and obviously you can buy more storage for, right. you know, a cost. Like that's right. fine, but it's still not going to be what people signed up for. It's, it's the definition of a bait and switch at this point. Right. Um, not only that, but. If you haven't touched your Google account for two years and don't respond uh, to the warning emails, the company may delete data from your account. <laughs> In the terms of conditions, they may delete those those items. And and you know, you, you talk about your dad, you know, wanting to, to put it on a hard drive. What happens if, you know, he's he's out of commission right. for two years, goes into a coma? Does he lose all of his files? <laughs> he still got them on the hard drive. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I hope so, because they may be gone from Google. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> the one the one interesting thing I'd point out here is uh, I, I did kind of find it pretty interesting was that they, they said today more than four trillion photos are stored in Google Photos and every 20 every week, 28 billion new photos and videos are uploaded. That's a lot. I wonder how many of those are going directly to TikTok. I can't fa- I can't even picture 28 billion is a lot. 4 trillion is a lot. I can't even put those into perspective. And should one company have all that power? <laughs> no, <laughs> absolutely not. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's, Google does a fair enough job with it. Uh, it's it's unfortunate that these type of shenanigans get pulled and... <laughs> And, you know, you, you end up with bait and switch practices at, at a company that, that is really, well, was trying to do a good thing for people. And, and now they're, they're going back on their promises. Like we're, we're promising this thing from, from day one, right? Yeah. Money for value, right? Google is advertising ability free. for, yeah. yeah, free, you know, for, for this. And, and, and they keep changing their tune. They used to be not evil and, and now they're not, not evil. I don't know if that's, means they're evil or not 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 evil i haven't heard that one so anyways i i you know i hope that this gets ironed out at least for the people who are reliant on this i i don't think either you and i are um but i think you know we definitely offer an alternative to this if people are looking for a way out so absolutely uh feel free to drop us a a note at rcompose.com if you want to get out of that trap be more than happy to help and then we have one final news item here that is almost not significant whatsoever, but is it's, it's kind of funny. <laughs> uh, I was I was just sitting here, you know, working on stuff and listening to music at the same time, and suddenly I was no longer listening to music. 
Do they have SLA? They don't have. I think I read in the article they don't have SLA. They're, they don't say they even have to host content. Yeah, so in the show notes, I, I did a little sleuthing because I wasn't exactly sure if YouTube had an SLA and, and really if they did what that was. As Jack and I are, are going back and forth trying to figure out these type of business decisions and and you know what what an sla should be you know a service level agreement uh, as far as like how often the service needs to be up obviously we can say we're going to be up all the time but we we all know that's never actually going to be an actual possibility i think we were talking about it earlier you know you can have you can have three nines as in 99.9 percent you can have four nines you can have five nines but you're never going to hit 100 that's just not the nature of of this world right so what what is the agreement that we have to make that we can make to say hey we we we're able to stand by this guarantee. We make this guarantee and, and we will do everything in our power to stand, stand by this. So I was looking if YouTube had the same type of thing. Uh, one of the, the, the phrases caught my eye from their terms and service that says YouTube is under no obligation to host or serve content. Which is crazy to think about. <laughs> well, and, and it's, you know, it's a free service. Once again, you're asking for stuff to be free on the internet. Guess what? You're not going to get a guarantee that you can always access the service in the same manner if you're not paying for it. If you're not directly exchanging value, sure, I mean, you're putting your time and, and your attention into this. You're watching yeah. their ads like a do netizen. But, I mean, really, is that is that really the way you want to go with this? Because it seems like this really isn't benefiting you in the in the long term this is this is at their behest you you're, you're kind of beholden at them to the, at this point to say hey do I still get to listen to videos today great that's awesome you should rejoice every day that that YouTube is still working and still serving you videos right and and especially if you you look at the most recent crackdowns on uh, you know, d different different forms of speech and and different points of view that are being censored off of off of YouTube. Yeah, they are completely within their rights to do that because you're not paying them a dime for this thing. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if you saw it. The one of the other things they're adding is uh, whether you monetize your content or not, they are now moving to you know if you don't monetize your content, they're still going to show ads on it. Yeah. I, I don't know what to think about that. I mean, I'm not happy about it. I'm my uh, due diligent uh, person here, and I obviously is an ad blocker, but yeah, no, it's it's been a long time since I've seen an actual ad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> on YouTube. Yeah, I, I can say the same. But no, it just kind of sucks for anyone creating content now that isn't monetizing it or directing people away to you know Patreon. Uh, we use Memberful to have a, an a, an ad shown now on your video. That just kind of sucks. No, it, it absolutely does. And and to not have the decision whether to say yay or nay on that. And obviously right. YouTube is is serving this content uh, and and at a loss to them at that point because they're paying for the bandwidth, they're paying for the storage. And if they can't monetize it because some little derpy content creator isn't going to click the checkbox right, you know, to, right. to, to, to do so, like they're, they're going to step in at that point and say, okay, you know what? I think we know a little bit better than you. We're going to start monetizing this because we need to. They're out of luck at that point. You, they, they really can't say anything. There's, there's a lot of other stuff in the terms of service that I saw that I was you know not happy about. But I mean, it's, it's a free service. It's right. you get what you pay for. And it's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> a good, that's a great thing to bring up. Honestly, you get what you pay for. But I did, I did take a look at this. The outage, I I call it was a, about an hour. Doing the math here, so I went to uptime.is, which is an awesome site. This is like the classic 1997 uh, internet. This is great. All it does is is give me the daily, mo weekly, monthly, and quarterly, and yearly uh, downtime available with different SLA agreements. So I can see what does a three nines, what is a four nines, what is a five nines SLA mean in terms of actual minutes and seconds and hours. Yeah. If we consider that this was the only outage YouTube had this year, right? They're the only outage at all. Then they are hitting about four nines of uptime. If this is their one outage this quarter, then they would be at like three and a half nines, which is 99.95. Not bad. It's not bad at all, right? And and obviously you can follow it down from there. You'll hit three nines and that would be like a monthly outage of an hour. That's still not bad, right? No, not at all. Especially if it's at like three in the morning. Yeah, right. 
You're not you're because who's missing it? Uh, unfortunately, this happened uh, right in the middle of the evening at about uh, eight o'clock uh, Eastern Standard Time. So there were there were a lot of people tuning in. Well, that's a decent amount. <laughs> that is a decent. That's not a great time. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Just having having been at the front lines of that and, and going back and forth and in chat looking at looking at some stats and, and some interesting stuff about YouTube, I thought I'd share what I uncovered. And uh, we definitely needed that to fill out the the news section of the show because I wouldn't say that there are any notable developments uh, made. Uh, the I'd say the two major ones that I guess that I fixed or added on to uh, Command Center, which I'll even toss in the show notes, was that it, it'll email it will email you now once your instance is deployed. So rather than having to refresh the page or wait or what you know what have you, uh, we'll send you an email when your deploy finishes, basically saying, "Hey, you're online and good to go." Yep. Did you say there was one more thing? Nothing external facing to anybody. It was IP block. So if you're going to spam our service, you better know how to do it. <laughs> I saw that in review. Yeah, you were you were really excited to get that done. That was actually de- that's actually deployed and that's in production right now. They weren't working. I'll let everyone know they weren't working originally. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to look at it and I was troubleshooting it today and I actually ended up getting a fix. Yeah, if you're going to abuse the site, good luck. It's not an open invitation to do so. <laughs> <laughs> We we do not condone trying to please spam our site. Please, <laughs> please do not. <laughs> yeah, we can dive into our integration discussion though. Yeah, today we're going to be talking about Portal. I, I'll tell you what though, I, the overview is a bit sad. I, I I don't know if it needs more juice or if it needs more information. Command Center on uh, obviously is like my baby is what I describe it because there's a, so much more going on in that application it's just so much more uh in depth is what i would say but i i'm starting to get into portal more portal was kind of like a I, i'm not i hate to even say it but it was kind of like a half big like hey we need something to send all our uh you know send we need a, a home page and quote unquote an actual portal to get people to where they need to go and to get them to all their services rather than rather than sending out like an email with all the urls to each service I think, I don't know how we came to it. We just decided to go in-house for Portal. I'll read off the description I have for it. It's nothing fancy. That's the totality of the documentation, by the way, folks. <laughs> this is all that's been written on here. So I do have application interface, which is pretty good. And it has pictures, which is really nice. Uh, it's kind of same with Command Center. But um, in the overview, I have this. It's a one sentence. <laughs> Portal is a web application deployed on our comp- on each R Compose instance, allowing users to manage their instance and the services running on their instance. Now, take that with a grain of salt, <laughs> because right now you cannot manage the services running on the instance. <laughs> so, uh, so it's coming soon, TM. So. <laughs> uh, portal coming soon. Yeah, honestly, portal coming soon, TM. Um. No, but I do have three documents that I did want to uh, mention and bring up. One was the, uh, they're all under application interface in that documentation. Uh, it's the getting started application interface, the customized application interface, and the backend features customized uh, application interface. Well, so so let's 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 kind of expand on on the, the yeah media portal because I, I think you you had a great little quip there. You were talking about hey, we just needed a portal to get to the yeah. the, the web pages, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So like like what did that what did that grow into? Because we had a couple other ideas with with what we wanted this to be for, which is which is different from command center. So having just gone over that in the last episode, command center being like our central command and control server, right? Building and everything for yeah. I guess us to manage our relationship with you, if that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. And and so so that being that central control server, Portal, to, to level set here, Portal is actually installed on all of the hosts uh, that we deploy. Every instance, right. So, yep. so you're going to have your own Portal instance, but why do people need their own Portal instance? I would say it's to manage your services. It's for you to talk to your services. Sure. So there are a lot of things that we want to do with it. Obviously, number one that I'm, I guess, most excited for, we're looking the most forward to is all the user management now granted it's a beast of stuff to do but being able to manage in one place all the users across all the services is going to be huge 
I'm not going to get into the authentication authorization stuff here, but it's a way to manage all your services. If you want to be able to spin up and spin down services on your instance, I think portal is going to be the way you're going to do that. That's at least how I see it coming for us in the future. I think the goal here is to have every application be able to be at least initialized with login information. Right. And we, we have that right now in the getting started, even that's what has, that's what has to be updated is the fact that, Hey, we actually initialize your portal instance with your command center password. We actually initialize all your services with your command center password. Right at the starting point, you're ready to go. You can log into anything that's been spun up for you. This makes it really comfortable to just jump in and get started. Which is so that's one of the features, Jack, you were talking about, you know, in the future managing the, the logins on the instance. Huge feature, yeah. So right now, uh some of the major features that we have in it are so you're able to add admins, um, which honestly right now is not much. You're adding it just to that portal instance. Uh, along with that, you're also able to update links on the front page and then also update the uh, nav at the top and the main brand at the very front. There is nothing crazy to this app right now. There's nothing crazy to this application. It's not doing anything super fancy. It's login and kind of customize. But there's a lot we want to do with it. And, and I think one of the things too is is you know Jack was saying that you can you can customize portal you can have users uh, user management is something that we definitely want to tackle as we move forward with this project but I think one of the other things is is too the the customization of the instances like there's there's a lot that goes in to to making this uh, insanely tweakable um, it, you know, right. it, especially like, well, how would you implement your own uh, Jekyll blog, for instance? Well, that's right. going to be something that's going to be customized on the back end for, for the time being. It's it's something that we handle. But the the, the Jekyll blog itself, right, you can you can do some crazy things with it. So I, I like spin it up and then I run extra commands on it. I specify my own Git repo. Like all these things are customizable in in our compose already what what portal is going to be looking into doing is is to provide an interface where those things those, can be you know checked yeah. unchecked set you know uh, different different ways of indicating Adding how services, you want your right. your uh, your services to be customized on top of you know what jack was saying here actually managing uh starting and stopping those services right right so it's a lot uh you the the other feature uh, i'll toss in there is you're able to migrate your instance which includes a full backup. So now that we know what Portal's for yeah, and what we're looking to have it be responsible for, how does it work? Very easy. Basically getting started, yeah, you're, you use the same password for Command Center. So you're able to log in immediately. It'd be yourinstance.rcompose.com. You're able to log in and it's just one page to add an admin, you're able to remove admins from that page, you're able to update the information from that page, you're able to remove links. If you don't want links to services, you're able to add links to services. I mentioned that you're able to migrate your instance. We also want to be able to provide uh, backups. So we do provide backups right now, but say you have critical information that you just uploaded and you need it backed up immediately. I don't, I don't know what, I don't know how often we're backing up. Yeah, I guess I, I could talk to that. So we're actually backing up every other day, uh, which is an in okay. incremental backup. So it will it will back up any kind of new information that's been put into there every two days. So um, that's definitely yeah. something we'd want to be triggering. But we do want to offer the, that immediate backup. Yeah. Yeah, backups are fairly quick since they're incremental. It's somewhere in the lines of 30 seconds to three minutes. Yeah, but uh, I mean... Other than that, for that portal application, it doesn't sound like a whole lot because right now it's not, but our plans with it are, I would say, uh, an undertaking is how I would describe them. But do we have any uh, analytics in portal? Not that I'm aware of, which means no. <laughs> I already said it. Uh, we have a lot more we want to focus on with portal and we're turning our attention toward, towards it more now. You know, it is an open source project. We do have it up on GitLab if you want to check it out. I highly recommend if you know Rails or JavaScript or CSS, CSS, fun times to clone it down and take a look at it, and you know, even drop in in the GitLab issues 
you know, maybe any feature you might want to see with it. But that's everything I have. All right. Well, with that, I'm going to dive in to the reason that we titled the show the way we did, which in this case is minimum viable portal. So obviously we wanted to, to touch on portal and, and kind of go over. I mean, this is a, a first step implementation of what we yeah. we have down the road. And, and obviously we have our ideas as to what is going to be beneficial going forward. And what, and what we think, right. But we could be completely wrong. Exactly. And, and I think the lean startup book that I had just uh, read kind of addressed that perfectly. So, so obviously there's a, there's a huge gap uh, in, in between a startup and a, you know, established corporation. Right. And, uh, and that, that gap consists a lot of how do you get to a point where you're comfortably rolling down the road with the type of work that you know is going to benefit you, that's going to benefit the customers, that is being done in a productive manner, uh, and that is really going to give you the best bang for your buck. So a lot of a lot of people that have gotten to that level are at the the corporate size uh, industries, you know, and 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 there's a lot of them, you know, some cookie cutter, some not so much, but they've they've all got something in common, which is they've been able to find their stride, and what the lean startup does is details out the steps to find that stride. So I have a I have a lot of show notes uh, in here, um, but I I definitely wanted to to touch on a on a couple points here. I was gonna say right now off the top of your head, what would you say the most important part of that book was? Validated learning, hands down. Okay, yeah, hands down, because it brings together both productivity and business decisions. Okay. Uh, so, so you and I, Jack, we're, we're, we're huge on productivity on the technical side of things. We can get stuff done, get stuff implemented, yeah. avoid tech debt. But I think the thing that is and, and, and going to continue to be a place where we can learn is going to be the, the business side of things with absolutely how do we prioritize, right? How, how do you get something that is going to be beneficial for the organization, right? As, especially right now, you know, in, in my day job, right? I'm, I'm kind of handed tasks that decision is above my pay grade. So how do you, how do you gain that mentality? And, and, you know, what are some, what are some ways to start taking a look at what you're doing from that point of view? And I think validated learning uh, is, is the way that Eric Reese uh, summed it up as, and I, and I think it's a, it's a perfectly good way to, to coin it. The, the way in which validated learning is actually used is within a feedback loop. And and we all know that feedback loops are going to be good. You can you can um, right. implement something, test it, then plan the next thing. Whether that's a rollback or, or or building a feature out, or concentrating on something completely different. So that that feedback loop is going to be key to making value judgments for the business, which builds off of the validated learning that's being gained. Right. Uh, the the interesting thing that Eric makes a, a point of calling out very early is that this validated learning, this learning process is implemented all the way down throughout the organization. So there is there is no one who is not responsible for measuring the business impact of changes, the changes that they're made, right? Uh, and, and in fact, that's how productivity becomes start to be measured. You know, how productive you are is how much value you've actually contributed to the business, right? Right. Uh, so we'll, we'll take a look at different, different methods to get those type of metrics where you can start gauging how productive you've actually been. His rationale for writing this is that the theories of management have treated innovation similar to a black box by focusing on the structures you need to put in place uh, around a startup or an organization. Yeah. Right. But once you find yourself working inside of that black box, like what, what do you actually have to do? You know, how, what should the team do? What processes should it use? You know, how should it be held accountable for performance milestones? Like that's, that's very interesting. And, and, and those are all valid questions to anyone who is setting their own, goals, you know, their, their path forward. So, so how do you do that? Well, one of the things he wanted to point out was you have to differentiate between value and waste. 
right? So which which of our efforts are going to be value creating and which of them are going to be wasteful? And and that's very important, obviously, to find out. And the way Eric will propose to do that is is by validated learning. Right? Yeah. So so his thought is that everything a startup does is understood to be an experiment designed to achieve a validated learning. Validated learning being uh, positive changes in metrics. Um, and those are the, the quantitative validation that what you've learned was real. So, so to take a step back from jargon, let's, let's talk about a, a real world scenario, right? If, if we, if we implemented uh, user administration uh, yeah. today, tomorrow, and rolled that out to, to whoever was willing to, to participate in that experiment of ours, we would want some kind of a metric feedback from them to determine whether that was actually useful in the first place. If it, if it wasn't used or wasn't useful, then it's not getting any value. That was a, a net waste. If it, if it didn't contribute anything to the business, it was a net waste. Now, there are caveats there, and we'll get to, we'll get to how to gather metrics, but the, the core of it is, is this something that people want and that they can demonstrate to us that they want by their use? Right. We want to follow the numbers in this game and that, you know, the, the, if the numbers don't look promising, there, there could be a, a problem with the strategy, but it doesn't mean it's necessarily time to, to give up totally. Um, and, and, you know, like I said earlier, the value in a startup is not the creation of the stuff, but rather the validated learning about how to build that sustainable business. Yeah. The two most important questions to ask though, when you start looking at what do we need to Keep in mind when yeah. we're, we're looking at KPIs, I, I think is actually a good way to put it, um, is rate of growth and retention rate or, or the comeback rate. And we can, we can estimate those and yeah, we can, we can estimate those, but, but they're always going to be assumptions until we validate them with learning about what happened when we implemented them. Right. So, so we, it's, it's fine to start making those assumptions. Um, and, and, we have to find out if it's fundamentally value creating or value destroying. What we want to do is is get out there and actually test it. Yeah, and and one of his things, I, I mean, this has been harped on forever. First products aren't meant to be perfect, right? They, the, the 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 people who are adopting these first products, right? They're the people who want to see the possibilities, who want to get on the in the in, in the ground level and say, hey, let's. Let's make this something really cool. And I can have a, a larger percentage of input, right, and, and make it cooler for me if I'm able to get on the ground level and if it's not yet fully developed. If, I, if, if you know, we hand off something that's fully baked, right, they have two options, take it or leave it. Right, right honestly. <laughs> and someone who's going to be an early adopter isn't necessarily going to be enthralled with those two options, right? So, so having a third one and say, hey, Give us feedback. Uh, you know, it's open source, so, you know, propose changes. Yeah, I was going to say PR into it, yeah. Exactly, right? So so it, open source actually gives us that fourth option, which is why it's so cool. One of the things I highlighted here, well, actually italicized, but either way, uh, was that the role of quality and design in an MVP, uh, the the – most modern businesses and engineering philosophies focus on producing high quality experiences for customers as a primary principle. These discussions of quality presuppose that the customer already knows what the attributes of the product the customer will be, will perceive as worthwhile. Uh, right. Yeah. So like in, in modern businesses, right. Or, or engineering, you're going to know as a fact, not as an assumption, but as a fact, what people want. Right. And then work off of that. Right. As a startup, you don't necessarily. So you don't know what people. Right. If you don't know who the customer is, it's impossible to know what quality is because you can't know what they want. So what do you what do you do with that? Well, you have to you have to get um, you have to get this kind of validated learning feedback. You have to say, all right, these this is something that people actually respond to. If we can get to those responses, we can start making these value judgments and measuring our productivity and value added rather than tasks completed. Right. So it becomes key to tackle measurement. 
Right. And and a startup's job is to, and they break it down here, both rigorously measure where it is right now, con- the product, confronting the hard truths that the assessment reveals, and then devising experiments to learn how to move the real numbers closer to the ideal reflected in the business plan. Especially yeah. if you're talking about number of customers or interactions or, or what have you, right? How do you how do you look at those those KPIs and how do you move them forward, right? Yeah. Well, in a handbag, you devise a whole bunch of little experiments and see if they make any difference on the numbers. Keep twisting the knobs, yeah. And here's the thing: I mean, if if you twist all the way to ten and nothing happens, maybe you're twisting the wrong knob. <laughs> yeah, you need to go back to the drawing board. <laughs> You need to delete that task off your Camboard instance. That's that's what I got out of that. <laughs> and he uses economics, and as a fan of economics, I love that he went this route. But but he uses the language of economics to explain how do you how do you make these kind of decisions? How do you how do you go right. about getting these measurements right? Um, so he makes habit of asking startups whenever that they meet, you know, are you making your product better? And they always say yes. And then he of asks, course. how do you know? To answer these kinds of questions, startups have a strong need for a new kind of accounting, right? Going back to economics that are geared specifically to disruptive innovation. How do you measure disruptive innovation that could be fluctuating wildly? Um, and, and innovative accounting works in three steps. Right. So first, using a minimum viable product to establish real data on where the company is right now. So, so getting that baseline. Second, attempting to quote unquote tune the engine from the baseline towards the ideal. And that's making those, those little tweaks. And then lastly, uh, a decision needs to be made whether to pivot or persevere. Now, decisions have to be made against good metrics right so you, you have to you have to ask yourself what's a, what's a good metric right um a a, a bad metric in, in his case he likes to call a vanity metric right and, sure. and that would be a metric that is not going to change regardless of anything that you do right so so that's just a bad metric it, it may look good you you may look good if you measure overall growth right but if your retention dropout rate is astronomical then not helpful the you know the the onboarding process isn't going to help you at all. Bo- boosting those numbers is not what is giving you uh, a, a successful startup here. So the the a startup has to measure pro- progress against the high bar, which is evidence that a sustainable business can be built around its products or services. Right. So you you're ultimately always testing that assumption. It's like can a sustainable business be made here, right? Is there enough need? Is there enough want? Are people valuing this enough for this to be viable of my time and their time and their value to right. to, to make this exchange, right? And his pitch is that the innovation accounting framework makes it clear when the company is stuck and needs to change direction um, or or judge its velocity as well, I would say. Um, so, so he goes into the three A's. Uh, which are necessary in in different metrics, right? So your metrics need to be actionable, accessible, and auditable. So being actionable means when cause and effect is clearly understood, people are better able to learn from their actions. Sure. Clear enough. Human beings are innately talented learners when given a clear and objective assessment. So the, the problem here is that if you if you're assessing tasks by the completion rate of the tasks but not the overall impact of the business, you're going to get smaller tasks being completed more often, not right. necessarily more value being created for the business. So so we need to take that into consideration. The accessibility part of it, being able to turn complex actions into people-based reports, right? And and he likes cohort-based reports because they bring in a a you know a, basically a sample group at the same time and grab metrics based on that entire group's history uh, rather than judge it against a historical group or a future group. And being able to take these different little snapshots and measure those snapshots as they differ from completely different individuals uh, yeah. rather than someone who may have a history versus someone who doesn't. 
Um, and, and the last one being auditable. So in, in, instead of you know, having something in a separate system, um, reporting data and its infrastructure should be considered part of the product itself and owned by whoever is developing that product. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's, that's why I asked if right. Portal had any right. analytics. And it doesn't right now, but it needs it. Yeah, uh, well, accor- according to this, right? So, so that, that would be the thought here in that, you know, if, if something gets introduced in a portal, the determination is going to need to be made, you know, is this a benefit to the business? Is it a value to the consumer? How is this being utilized? And, and is it? So, so going through that and, and figuring out how that is, however, we need to. Um, the innovation accounting aspect of this provides a framework to to make those judgment calls those those large judgment calls uh, as to whether to pivot or persevere it, that that accounting gives a framework as to how you start making those decisions and saying hey this is this is in fact something that we need to to change right or or this had no effect at all or we right. are right on the right track that we need to be at let's continue down this path once you once you reach a something that something that works right it, once once you get something that works um you have to learn on how to accelerate right um toyota's lean manufacturing emphasized small batches uh in order to catch defects quicker and to avoid uh progress backlogs like uh, and yeah and i think it it did a really good Working job progress of that. yeah and and the the feedback loop that we were talking about earlier going through building, measuring and learning is, is going to be our way of implementing lean manufacturing inside of a company where you, where you build something, then you measure it and then you, you derive your learning from it. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. And, and one of the things which is directly relevant to, uh, Kanban instances is the pull model instead of the push model where you can only take on new work if you have a hole to fill, you know, in, in your, in your productivity cycle or what, what have you. Right. So if you're, if you're going through and you have five different tasks on your plate, right. And your limit is five, your whip limit is five. I mean, you're not going to pull something else in. Right. And that creates a not before seen impact on your organization. So, so the impact was always there. Right, but it's harder to see if you don't implement these kind of whip limits, right? For right. for instance, if you have a left to right progress and something at the very far right is stopping the progress so that you can't move stuff over anymore, you get stalled out and you're like, "All right, I can't I can't do the cool stuff anymore, which is going to be at the far left. I can't write the code. I can't do the thing, right? I can't I can't do the thing, right? Until I deal with what's at the far right. Well, what ends up being at the far right is going to be all that validation, like did I learn something? Does this change metrics, right? Baking that into the process makes it so that you can't take on more of the cool things without dealing with the does this create value. It's almost columns in the kanban to add like a validate pending validation and validation. And then it goes to done to force you to have to deal with, hey, did this add value? What what metrics are we looking at for these things that we added? Yeah, and I I know you and I have have review right, which is going to be a review typically before it gets pushed out. But if that becomes a let's push this out, at, you know, to a to a it's, subset, and we review, review the it impact and, yeah, of come the back to it. yeah yeah yeah. If, if that's what you know review now means, right, then that would hold up some of the cool work because we have to do that validation before we can pull any more work in our way. Right. And I like the thought of that even. It, 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 the system is now being the driving factor in value decisions rather than some esoteric. Arbitrary. It's going to be right. uh, otherwise. Yeah. Otherwise, it, it would absolutely be arbitrary. And it has to be a decision. Now it's a decision, at least based on data. Yeah. It's a, it's a quantified decision because the data, right. the, the decision can be quantified with that data. Now, in order to get good data, you're going to have to know why you're getting data in the first place, like why, why you're getting growth in the first place. Right. Besides validated learning, I think this is going to be the most impar- important part of my takeaway personally from the book is growth. Where does growth come from? Right. So so he said, you know, the the engine of growth and he, he's coining. This ah, yes, here. the engine of growth. 
said you were coming back to it. <laughs> <laughs> the engine of growth, yeah, is the, the mechanisms that startups use to achieve sustainable growth. Sustainable growth is characterized by one simple rule. New customers come from the actions of past customers. And that's, that's interesting. He, he talks about the four primary ways that past customers drive sustainable growth, right? So there is word of mouth, uh, which is obviously just going to be word sure. of mouth, uh, as a side effect of product usage. So you think about any kind of social media, right? If you're sharing something with someone else, they get a link to that site. They are now going to that site. So that would be a direct side effect. If you are uh, sharing a link on your next cloud to your holiday, you know, photo album to someone, yes, they are going to be using the product, but they're not going to be a customer of the product. So it's, it's not quite as tangible if we think about this as someone coming, you, you actually have to come in to use the product. The other two are, are fairly obvious to the rest of us. So fund, funded advertising, uh, and then repeat purchase or use. So if you're using, sure. uh, right. consulting or automation or, or anything else, anything that, that is in upsell on the product itself would be a repeat purchase. He has, several different engines of growth i think is like nine or so that wow, he okay. that he liked to define and, and obviously these are all going to intermesh and and uh, work with each other but three of the ones that he detailed out in the actual book not in the appendix at the end were uh, sticky viral and paid right which which i think he he said were the most segmented most individual and so so sticky here he was talking about uh, it's something that relies on having a high customer retention rate. So we were talking about before, if you're looking at your metrics and you see a lot of people being onboarded, but you're not looking at all the people who are dropping off, right? You're not looking at the right stat. You're looking at the the the, the wrong a statistic. glamour stat. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So if you know that your engine of growth is based on having a high customer retention rate, then you're going to know that you need to now look at that metric right if if that's your model this is your metric so uh what you want to do specifically for that is is track the attrition rate uh or or also known as the churn rate very carefully uh, and then if the rate of new customer acquisition exceeds the churn rate the product will grow he's laying it out for us here here's 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 your problem right here's your your metric and Here's your accounting for how to measure it. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. Here's your economic formula, right? If new customer acquisition exceeds churn rate, you're fine. Right. <laughs> if not, you're in trouble. <laughs> right. So now you can start looking at those two metrics and say, okay, so we have a high customer growth rate. We could make that better, but our attrition rate is terrible. Right. If you're, if you're thinking of a sticky growth, uh, type of type of model right what can we do to get people to stay on our product right and that's that's going to become more important to you and you're going to be able to prioritize things that are more fo focused on on that the the next one he goes over is viral i'm going to skip that almost completely because that's that's social media that's depending on person to person transmission as a sure. as a consequent of that that normal use um, but it is something he goes into the in the detail on in the book uh, and then the the paid model as well. Uh, he's like, this is the this is the simplest in that you only need to know one thing, and that is how much it costs to sign up a new customer, right? Okay. If if that customer is worth more to you than it takes to sign them up, you're golden. Yeah, exactly. So once again, though, right? More than one engine of growth can operate in a business at one time. Sure. Obviously, that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. And and for us, I mean, viral ne necessarily isn't going to come into play. Uh, however, sticky and paid are are both going to be interacting About in it, right. what we're doing. So we're going to have to need to consider both and track information on on both of those and and see what we can do to to help those out. So uh, he you know he talks about market fit. When a startup finally finds a widespread set of customers that resonate with the product. Um, a startup can evaluate whether it's getting closer to product or market fit 
as it tunes its engine by evaluating it each trip through the feedback loop using innovation accounting. And I, you know, I, that's, that's kind of the crux of this entire book, not just this section is that, you know, you're, you're going to see, are your tuning knob twistings making the, the product better are uh, using innovation accounting, right? Right. Uh, using the validated learning, using the metrics that you're gathering. Um, one interesting point he made here uh, under the subheading, when engines run out, he said, every engine of growth eventually runs out of gas. Uh, he said, you know, they're, they're all tied to a given set of customers and their related habits, preferences, advertising channels, and interconnections. At some point, that set of customers will be exhausted. Period. Point blank. So, so you know, what, what do you do at that time? Right. And that's, down the road, right? As a startup, you're not necessarily concerned about that, but keep that in mind, especially if you have two engines working in tandem. If one of them sputters to a halt because you've exhausted that engine of growth, now you're, you're down to one or the other two that you have. And, and you can now focus on those. The decisions or the, the prioritizations to, uh, to, to, to build things for the, the first engine, the one that's run out aren't going to be valuable anymore. You're, you're going to need to drop that. And and that could be a pivot, right? That that could absolutely be a pivot, or it could be pursuing the other two at the neglect of the first. But that is something to, to look out for down the road. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're done, but it means that you need to do something else. Pivot. Said it pivot. earlier. Right. Basically pivot. Yeah. Essentially. He starts out one of the sections with this sentence. He says, having no system at all is not an option. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair I enough. mean, honestly, yeah. <laughs> That's, I'm glad he said that because I'm sure some people, you know, it's one of those things you can skate by. You can probably skate by and be like, well, we don't really have a system going on. It's just kind of working for us. He even he even has a term for that. He calls it you're stuck in the land of the living dead at that point. You're just you're sputtering to a slow. It's slow. slow yeah, I can, yeah, 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 yeah. So he's 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 like, you, you got to be measuring the sometime or else you, you're not going to know when to pivot or persevere. So, right. You have no idea. Yeah. Because you're not following any, would you say, quantifiable data? So this is, you know, we, we, we started out talking about, you know, being in a black box and what you need to do within that black box and stuff. And, you know, we've, we've gone through measuring metrics. We've gone through, you know, prioritizations. Um, so, so in here, he's talking about how, how do we adapt, right? How do we adapt when something goes wrong or something needs to be prioritized? And uh, he has a, a framework called the five whys, uh, which, which I found interesting. The system takes its name from the investigative method of asking the question why five times to understand what has happened and get to yeah, the Yeah, that's, uh, I think, lean, lean production system from Toyota is that oh, five yeah, whys. lifted directly from yeah. the lean production system. Yep. Yeah. Uh, you know, one, one of the examples he uses is, all right, what happened here, you know, and someone's like, the machine broke down. And he's like, why? And they're like, uh, <laughs> it, it, it stopped functioning. Why? There was a screw caught in the mechanism. Why? Because the screw came, uh, you know, came loose. Why? Because we didn't tie it down or, or we didn't, we didn't, we didn't screw it down tight enough. Yeah. Why? Because there was a grill in the way that we couldn't tighten it down enough. And you're like, oh, okay. So all you got to do is fix that grill and this problem is never going to happen again. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and you're getting to the root cause of the problem. And obviously that's never going to happen 100% of the time. But this is a very good method to get you to that point. Using that in order to get to the heart of the problem is, is a system that he's very fond of. Uh, so so he had, he had a lot in that. Uh, he said if, it goes, if that process goes awry, he starts calling it the five blames. Uh, and then, then you start you start blaming people instead of trying <laughs> like to figure that. out why something <laughs> happened. You're like, you did this. It's like, well, okay, we're off track now. Quit pointing the finger. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and and he asks uh, he asks uh, teams that are, are doing the five wise to have two simple rules here. He's like, be tolerant of all mistakes the first time. That's the first rule. Second rule is never allow the same mistake to be made twice. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. You do that, you're good. good right? It's a good rule. And, uh, you know, a, a lot of this, I don't know. 
he has a, he has a line in here about all technical problems being human problems. I'm not necessarily sure if that's the case, um, but I, I definitely would, would say there's always going to be a human component in all kinds of problems. So if yeah. you can at least address that human component, taking care of the technical one is just a, a task of buckling down and fixing that tech debt, whatever that is. That's really the what I wanted to to cover there. Yeah, I really like this quote that you put the, there. The quote I pulled was was this. I've noticed this pattern every time. Switching to validated learning feels worse before it feels better. That's sure. the case because the problems caused by the old system tend to be intangible, whereas the problems of the new system are all too tangible. Having the benefit of theory is the antidote to these challenges. If it is known that this loss of productivity is an inevitable part of the transition, it can be managed actively. Well, right. why, why, once again, why do we need this system? Well, we need the system because it is forcing us to slow down and become less, quote unquote, productive. If my productive is sitting in front of a computer eight hours a day and coding without any kind of thought about how this is impacting anyone else or the business around me, then then, yeah, this is absolutely going to affect my production because I'm now going to have to learn things about how the organization functions, right? I'm going to have to learn what the engine of growth is. I'm going to learn what metrics make sense to us. And I'm going to have to learn how those metrics are affected by my change. Once, however, I achieve those validated learning results, then I can apply them to my next task and my next task. And I can make, I can be empowered to make those business decisions as a direct result of getting tasks. It can't be just this void that you walk into without any kind of forethought or any kind of like w reasoning why you have to take it and say, okay, I'm doing this because this leads to this, this leads to the better result. Throughout the book. I mean, I think Eric does a really good job setting up the way to get there, you know, it, given, given that, as a as a problem um, so i was i was really happy to to be able to go through this book i i think you know as we touched on there were a lot of good points uh specifically uh validated learning uh the feedback loop uh definitely the engines of growth uh and and the different metrics to track and and i will definitely be interested to experiment with incorporating those in the future you know and as we say in the intro we're a fan of productivity solutions we're hosting these applications in order to make people more effective at what they do, right? And 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 this is a great framework, and I, I think we fit into this very well. So if you need to find your way to direct your creativity and, and channel your passions, uh, go ahead and, and sign up for an R Compose instance today, and we would be happy to work with you to get this underway. And with that, we hope you enjoyed this episode of R Composecast. Thank you. Be safe. And we'll see you all in two weeks.